perspective, why do we need a sustained Arctic uh, observing system? What are the time scales? How far have we come? And where do I see the main uh, challenges or opportunities to move forward? Uh, to start off, of course, the, the Arctic is a, a special place, and that reflects itself in the way we can observe it. So if we are looking at, and that's a picture from just a few days ago, there is a, an ice cover in winter over the central Arctic, pretty much covering all of it. It retreats in summer, more so now than in the past. And then there's quite a bit of uh, ice uh, over land on, on, and on glaciers and the Greenland ice sheet, the, naturally making access more difficult than to some sites in, in lower latitudes. But while that's the case, it also is a global part of the, it, it's a, an integral part of the global system. And that's uh, sort of um, illustrated here by looking at the surface ocean salinity map. So you, you see that it, it is a, an essential part that delivers fresh water from high latitudes into the lower latitudes. And you could make other connections through the atmosphere and, and, and other uh, part of the compartment. Now, that system, not, not only is it difficult to observe it in principle, and we saw that early on when we tried to get a good look at what the Arctic system actually looks like in its principal components and how they function, but when we started to do that, we saw pretty early on that it actually, over the past few decades, it is changing very rapidly. And that is not just happening in the physical system, such as the uh, sea ice cover, which is one of the, the, the big sort of poster childs of uh, global warming, but also in the oceanic circulation and water mass composition in the uh, increased air temperature over most of the Arctic, permafrost, melting of the ice sheet, but importantly, it doesn't stop there. It translates into changes in the uh, impacts and, and changes that come from that impact in the socio-economic and socio-cultural systems. There are large impacts on the Arctic itself, but also on low latitudes. And one thing that we really need is to understand them and figure out how to deal with them, how to respond to them, how to find solutions to the problems that are created by these changes. I just will show a few pictures of uh, the changes. I'm, I'm sure all of you have seen them, but just before we are going into contemplating how we want to, observing, uh, to observe that, I think it is probably a good uh, opportunity to just reflect upon a, a few of them. So we do have an amplified warming compared to the globe. The globe warmed by about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 degrees Celsius over the past few decades. In the Arctic, we have a warming that's about two to two and a half times that. Uh, that is something that has been uh, projected by global models, but now we are really seeing it play out. Um, one, as I mentioned before, one of the, the main features of the Arctic and, and sort of an iconic feature is the sea ice cover over the, uh, the central Arctic. And this is uh, retreating, and, and uh, last year we hit a record minimum, uh, a big step down from the previous one, which was in 2007. And <clears throat> over the past six years, we actually have the, the sea ice extent at the beginning of September has fallen significantly below uh, what was the average uh, between 79 and 2000 and, uh, and, and, and the year 2000, the, uh, the era over which uh, satellite information is available. If we are looking at that in a time series, you can see this, this trend. Uh, some people feel that it's actually accelerating over the past, whatever, roughly five to ten years. But even if you don't, uh, you know, look at this kind of uh, fine structure, it, it is declining, the sea ice cover is declining by about 13 percent uh, per year. We also have, if you are looking at 1988, uh, 09, 10, 2011, so if you compare these three with sort of one early depiction of the sea ice cover, you can see that it's much more vulnerable. A lot of the multi-year ice of the thick ice has been flushed out or melted in place. And now we actually need much smaller triggers to create big changes in the sea ice extent and the volume. So the, the sea ice cover has been conditioned towards a much more vulnerable system, much closer to what we see in, uh, around Antarctica in terms of a seasonal feature than what we were used to when we started to look at it. 
But there are other parts uh, that are equally important. So for example, if we're looking at a green and ice sheet, we see that there is an increase in the surface area that is undergoing melting in summer. And uh, last year, at about uh, July 12, uh, the entire surface, rough, more or less the entire surface of the green and ice sheet, was undergoing uh, melting. And that in itself, of course, you can say that's, uh, you know, that's serendipity at, at, and, and, you know, it, uh, it doesn't happen all the time and not very frequently, but it is one of many features where we have uh, so-called extreme events around the globe. It also had an, an interesting impact because within virtually hours or a day, the fresh water that was coming off the surface uh, flooded uh, some of the coastal communities to the extent that infrastructure was washed away. And some people say, yeah, that cannot happen. You know, you need more time to get all that fresh water from here to there. Don't forget that you don't have to transport all that, but you have pressure transmission of, uh, of these uh, events and you're squeezing out in, in, in matter of uh, very short time scales. Permafrost, another uh, very important feature of the high Arctic for transportation, for infrastructure, etc., cetera, is, uh, is thawing and uh, the projections are that this is uh, progressing. And you know, these phenomena that I just uh, depicted are not going to stop, but any kind of projection that we have right now point towards the fact that we are just seeing the beginning of an ongoing process and that by the year uh, 2100, depending on which scenario for the emissions we are taking, we are seeing you know, an increase in the, in the warming effect and that ripples through the system and uh, amplifies all the you know, impacts that we are seeing. So this is not just a, a matter of scientific curiosity, but it, it really has true impacts. And the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment, which was released in 2004, in November 2004, has actually captured a lot of those. And uh, some of them are more local, such as, for example, the uh, opening of the sea routes, but uh, also the vulnerability of infrastructure, uh, the access to the inner Arctic for extraction of resources, but also for travel and for, for hunting. It also has uh, implications for places far away from the Arctic in terms of sea level rise, mainly through thawing of the, um, to, through melting of the ice sheet and some of the glaciers. And if you are just taking Florida as one example, you could go to other places. Um, then you, you see that projections for the end of the century show that uh, some of the areas that we uh, value highly are threatened by inundation. This is, of course, one of the uh, iconic pictures, uh, Shishmaref, where coastal erosion due to uh, removal of permafrost leads to uh, coastline erosion and the infrastructure that was built on top of these uh, coastlines is uh, deteriorating and, and threatened. So there are, there are real consequences that we have to deal with and we have to carefully listen and, and, and look at what they are because we have to you know, provide knowledge that gives options for what is the best way to deal with that. Is it uh, fortification? In this case, probably not. Is it relocation? In, 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 in that case, where to? How far away from the coast? And so on and so forth. So in response to all that, uh, the scientific community has created uh, quite a few programs that are dealing with, with Arctic change. And <clears throat> for example, the International Study of Arctic Change but others like Search, ArcticNet, Access, Damocles, and so on, and, and Interact, uh, Sios, um, have, have looked at what, what are we actually seeing and what is prudent to do. And for example, in the ISAC science plan, one of the main goals is to inform stakeholders about options for response to these changes. But in order to do that in an intelligent way, we actually have to know what the system looks like and how, where the system is coming from and where the system is going. That means you have to observe it, you have to feel the pulse of that system as it moves forward, but you also then have to understand in a dynamical sense what does that mean and how can we use that knowledge to project it forward and come up with options for uh, how to deal with it. And so we, we typically in these programs, uh, many of them actually revolve one way or the other around similar components which 
have an observing component, an understanding component, and a responding component. So I don't want to go into much detail here. I just wanted to bring up some of the science questions to you know, quickly review against what are we actually designing an observing system. And this is just one set of science questions that in this case was done by the International Study of Arctic Change. And there are two slides. The first five are pretty much dealing with the physical system. How is it linked to global change? How persistent is the change? Is it unique? Is it anthropogenic? How much is the anthropogenic component compared to natural variability? Um, why is it amplified? Um, do we understand that? And in the, in the end, how well can we uh, um, project this Arctic change into the future? If you are looking at the second part, you can see there is a, it's much closer related to societal needs. So here we are looking at adaptive capacities um, of Arctic ecological systems. We are looking at uh, social and ecological systems and, and how they are able to adapt, and particular here social systems, socio-economic, socio-cultural systems. Um, we are looking at uh, how this environmental change uh, affects resilience, adaptive capacity, and in the end, the viability of uh, human communities as they are, exist right now. And then finally, we are looking at how we can use the insight that we are gaining from these observing and understanding activities into a, a, a translation to solutions for adaptation, management, and mitigation so that we have as, as few disruptions as possible given the circumstances. Now looking at the uh, observing, uh, uh, at, at, at how we are observing the Arctic, as I mentioned at the beginning, it was always difficult to observe the Arctic under harsh environmental conditions. But now we have rapid change that adds a lot of urgency to this task. So it's not that we have a lot of time to make our way into that uh, difficult task. The Arctic, after all, is the place that shows right now on the globe the most dramatic change in terms of amplitudes and, and pace. So the, this changing Arctic then requires long-term observation so that we can actually uh, filter out the trends from the natural variability, and it has been mentioned before, we are looking at decadal observations. And importantly, the Arctic observing systems that we are looking to build and that this summit is all about has to document changes in all the subsystems. So we have to go from the physical to the biogeochemical to the socio-economic and the socio-cultural systems. And that really means that if we want to do that in, in, a, in a, a reasonable way, we have to look at stakeholder needs and they have to be addressed at the very beginning of the design of the, of the system. And as some of the components are already in the system, we have to make sure that we uh, adjust so that this is uh, an, in, an in integral part. And as already has been mentioned, uh, it, it has to be an international, closely coordinated effort because the task of a pan-Arctic system is simply too big for any nation or a small set of nations. Now it's not that we are starting from the beginning. Uh, before the IPY even, I would say 10, 15 years ago, we have started to put observing components into the Arctic system. And some of them are functioning you know, very well and are giving us a wealth of data. And uh, here is just uh, one depiction of the uh, atmosphere, well, space, atmosphere, um, sea ice, ocean system. And you, you can see there are different components, some more traditional like uh, airplanes and ships and some much more advanced in technology such as uh, um, the ice tethered uh, profilers and, and uh, gliders in the water and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's not that we are starting from scratch. What we are looking for is how can we complete that system and how can we find processes to, to sustain them. So if we are looking at that uh, in, in that list, as I said, we are actually implementing these components in quite a while. We have started with the integration of these components because one uh, major task is to not, not just have a, a lot of observation activities going on but to make sure that there is synergy between them and that we really can uh, get the, the maximum benefit from synchronizing them. The, the focus has to shift from, uh, to operationalization because we are doing a lot of the, the observations 
in still in a research mode or in a pilot mode. Some of them, I think, are ready to go into operational mode, and we really have to make sure that we are driving that uh, transition. Otherwise, our research uh, will will be burdened too much by by this um, process. We also have to look at uh, the uh, an, an accelerated transformation of the observing system from a pure research observing system to a system that also serves stakeholders and their needs, and and that that process uh, is going on. Much more recognition of the of that need, much more recognition that we have to build a, a de facto hybrid system, but still quite a bit of work to do. And I hope that the summit here will, and I'm sure the summit will address that, and I hope we will make uh, quite a bit of progress on how to do that. So in my view, I think the Arctic Observing uh, Summit and, and, and future summits you know, should focus not so much on trying to review science. I think we have programs that are doing that. There are science plans out there. If we find, from an observing point of view, that some of these scientific plans are missing components, certainly that should be communicated and it should be fixed. But the main focus, in my view, should really be on thinking about how to take these scientific needs and these uh, stakeholder needs and get to a sustainable system that operates uh, in, a, in, in an operational mode. Uh, as I said, bring stakeholders in from the very beginning into the uh, discussion of what is needed, uh, co-generate uh, knowledge and designs. We have to think, uh, as has been mentioned before, hard about how to fund all that and do that in new ways unconventional ways because the problem we are facing is not one that we have had in the past. It has different dimensions, so we have to think with new creative methods how to meet that challenge. And the international collaboration, as mentioned before, um, is, is extremely important because of the, the nature of the task. So to, to sum up, I think the, the international Arctic uh, community has actually laid out an architecture for a a pan-Arctic, long-term, cross-domain Arctic observing system. That's a real difficult task because there are no templates for that. We are looking at expansion of our typical activities in many ways. The IPY actually has provided an impetus to implement major components of an Arctic observing system. And when I say Arctic observing system, it's of, of course shorthand for a system of networks or a system of systems that is integrated. There are uh, efforts underway to optimize the design of that system, and an example was seen in uh, David's uh, presentation. The uh, Aeon Design and Implementation Task Force had put, has put a, a report out. Stakeholders has to be, have to be involved in all aspects of Arctic observing, not just, uh, you know, we, we cannot just think that anything that we do out of the scientific community will trickle into that domain. Uh, we have to sustain the existing components and fill gaps. And that's a challenge, and that's what uh, is a ma major part of here. We have to get more operational for some of the observing system components that have proven as stable and uh, yielding the kind of uh, results that we are looking for. And I, I want to come back and, and close with a point of urgency. We, we don't have you know, a lot of time to do that because the changes are rapid. We know that within a few decades or so, the uh, Arctic might be ice-free, the Arctic Ocean might be ice-free in summer. There are other um, changes that need uh, immediate responses because they are threatening people who are living up there. There are global changes or glo effects, uh, global effects of the Arctic change, which actually are a feedback loop of how we drive the Arctic from, from uh, low latitudes. So we, we have, I think this urgency has to sink in, not just in the Arctic community, but also in the Arctic community. So I hope that with that in mind, we are moving through these next three days and future summits and uh, make progress in how to uh, move our agenda along. Thank you.